It's Professor Grant Schofield here with a Precure Ask Me Anything podcast. I'm joined with the rest of my R&D team, Kayla. Hi, Kayla. Hey, Grant. And we're super excited today to have a guest on the show, Olivia Melamatinius. Olivia is a recent master's graduate from the AUT program. In fact, I was her supervisor in her nutrition work, and she's recently taken a role with Buttermean Motivation, which is actually a really exciting program in the south of Auckland, a really high needs area, working with people who have had a lifelong problem with their weight and, and the end chronic disease. So hi, Olivia. Hi, Grant. Hi, Kayla. So, so, so tell us about the job. You just finished your thesis and, and you've gone straight into a pretty demanding job. Yep. Straight into the workforce. So we've um, got a variety of programs. This one is from mainly called From the Couch. So we're working with um, those out South Auckland doing nutrition work and also exercise programs, just teaching them about food literacy. So this Butterbean Motivation has been going for quite a few years. In fact, it's pretty famous when it's done, but it's really concentrated you know, pretty much solely on exercise. How come the nutrition bits come in? I think Dave's really noticed that if he ditches his fizzy drinks and makes sure he's going for a walk, then that can make big differences in the health and dropping the weight and helping with his brain health as well because he's really big on the mental health aspect, which is awesome. Yeah, I suppose, uh, as you know, that diet and mental health are so interlinked as yep. is diet and physical activity, as is physical activity and mental health. So that, that trilogy is pretty important. Okay, who are you working with? What sort of clients are we talking about here? Yep, so we're working with mainly those with obesity. We've got diabetics. So it's a range of health conditions, and we're actually teamed up with some to, um, Total Health Care, and they're sending a lot of their patients on board with us to join our programs. So what are we looking at? The mild weight issues, severe weight issues? What just a typical patient tell, tell us about um, definitely on both ends of the scale, we've got those reaching over 300 kgs um, to about 100 kgs, so a full spectrum. What are your challenges? The main challenges, I think, is getting them, putting them time aside for themselves. So a lot of these families have um, lots of children and don't put the time to work on themselves. So just getting them in there for a starter and just turning up to both the um, cooking sessions and the theory because sometimes it can be a bit challenging for them to get there. Oh, right, so tell us about the different content and how does that work over a 12-week program? So every week is different, learning about um, just trying to increase their food nutrition knowledge, increase their cooking, self-efficacy. Um, there's a bit of mindful eating practice, the whole ecological factors, so the social, cultural influences, and also just trying to reduce those barriers of um, expensive foods. So there's a whole variety of different topics we cover, which has been awesome. Okay, so what advice are you giving people like, around process and ultra process and whole foods? Because especially when they're on a budget, I'm assuming this is a pretty high needs community. It's a fair bit of poverty. Yeah. Uh, and my observation of going to, to the supermarket, the, the ultra processed rubbish is actually much cheaper than the whole food. How, how are you even dealing with that? How do you deal with that issue? The main things I'm trying to promote to them is just to stick to the whole foods and um, lots of fruit and vegetables. So even if they need to buy the frozen or the canned foods, so that's one thing I do try and push them quite often. But just trying to make those small switches from the white bread to the more whole grains and get yeah, fruit and vegetables is a big thing that I push push onto them. Yeah, I suppose frozen berries are a good example, right? They're actually reasonably good value compared to actual fresh berries, which I find reasonably poor value. Yep, and they last longer too. And they make good smoothies. Caleb? Yeah, I just think it's really interesting. What I'd be interested to know is um, how how easily this group takes on this kind of advice. Is it a slow process? Is it a quick process? Um, how much sort of hand-holding is needed? Uh, Outside of the um, 12 root programs, I do get a lot of support. So this is online, just checking in. But Recently, we are, have just targeted and we're getting new people on with the 12-week programs we run. So previously, they have kind of stuck with us for three to four years on the same program. So it has taken them a while, but they have definitely, from me walking in as a new person, I've noticed that they have really implemented the nutrition um, classes and making those healthier decisions over the three years. And can you tell me what success looks like for some of these people? I know like... 
you know, as a health professional, somebody who's in the health field, like we want big radical changes and people that completely turn their lives around. But is that realistic with this group? Yep. I've got some awesome key examples and it's just even the knowledge of incorporating more legumes into their diet or sharing lots of great recipes that they use and just having that knowledge and being able to support others around them. So we do have um, Matua Barry who uh, is on board with us just to help support the participants that come through the programs, which has been a big help. Olivia, what did you learn at uni that's been helpful and what did you learn at uni that you've had to pick up? That's what I'm interested in. You've done a whole master's degree and an undergraduate degree where you've covered your health, health promotion, nutrition. What's different when you get into the world? Well, the nutrition knowledge was great learning about all the different macro and micronutrients, but trying to simplify that and give that into the public can be quite, quite difficult because just simplifying those terms down, especially to those that don't have a very high nutrition knowledge and just being able to present them with some big bulk recipes for their families and teaching them how to eat on a budget. So the whole budgeting skills and making meal plans and that, I think that is definitely one area that I did not learn at my stud- in my university studies that would have definitely helped with the programs that I'm now running. So one thing when we, we, we do nutrition education, at least at the uni, we talk a lot about different types. We do low carb, we've got keto, we've got vegan, plant-based and that sort of thing. It sounds like you don't touch any of those things. Do people come in with those types of ideas or are you just going for the whole food type approach? For now, i just starting with the whole whole foods approach, but for the diabetics, being uh, introducing the whole low carb is something I definitely want to start implementing. And what about the people themselves? Are they coming with any preconceived ideas? Yep. And we do have one session where we talk about all the different fair diets and what just that what media portrays and presents to them because that has a big influence as well. And, and what do you see? What do people say? I'm really interested in that. I think it's just all the low carb keto is another a big thing that people talk about very often for the keto diet and carnivore, vegan, all of the different diets are commonly discussed. So Jared Cannon is one of our health coaches as we said in South Auckland. He just actually goes with any of those types. So he's he's quite happy to go with carnivore for some people. He's quite happy to go with keto for some people. He's quite happy to go with low carb. He's quite happy to go with whole food. It just depends on the person. He's quite flexible with that. What do you make of that? Yeah, something that I want to be able to just, especially working with more individualized. So at the moment, it is kind of the whole group focus. But if I was able to look more at the individual diets, that's something I would love to be able to offer. Cool. Kayla? Yeah, what are some of the misconceptions? You say people come to these sessions talking about keto and talking about vegan. What are the, some of the things that they think are true but might not be so true? The whole fats are bad for me. Fats are bad for me. I've definitely spoken about and trying to just educate them on the good fats. And at the end of the 12 weeks, they know that avocado is great for them and the good olive oils and everything. So that is one big misconception that commonly comes through. Nice. And do you mainly work with adults or is there some uh, scope to work with teenagers and younger children? Yep. So we're mainly working with adults at the moment, but two, one youth program has just started, which is going to have a nutrition component to that. There's also Fano and family program starting. So that's going to be getting them in with their kids in the kitchen cooking as well. And all of these programs will have the nutrition aspect connected to them, which is going to be great to reach those wider audiences. Awesome. Okay, well, you heard it first, that's what our graduates get up to. So really proud of what you've done, Olivia, with with your graduate work and your nutrition work and to see you land in like a really high needs program, serving the community on the ground, being nutrition to me, it's really exciting. I'm really proud of what you've been able to achieve there. So, you know, just wish you all success as you keep growing in that job, because I think that's, as it continues, you're just going to grow more and more. So, well done. Thank you, Grant. It's an awesome role and I've really been enjoying being able to help and share my knowledge and see the big successes that come through as well. Very rewarding. Yeah, we've got a few student questions today. Interesting topics. What have we got? Yeah, so today we're mainly talking about metabolic health and the impacts of um, different nutrients on the body. So the first thing before we even jump into a student question that I wanted to talk to you about is that exciting new paper that's just come out looking at the dose response relationship between carbohydrate reduction 
and different markers of health and diabetics. Oh, yeah, well, that's great. That was in the, uh, it's, it's a meta-analysis in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, 2022, June edition. And they've just taken a bunch of studies on looking at diabetic outcomes. So mainly the primary one is obviously HbA1c, so blood glucose, but they've got fasting blood glucose, blood pressure, weight, all of the lipid panels. And, but you combine all the studies and you can look at the degree of carbohydrate restriction. I think they start with the reference being 60% being carbohydrate, which is the sort of standard diet for recommendations. And they show then in every 10% decrease in carbohydrate consumption. These are the results of combined results across all of the randomized trials that you just get this really nice linear dose response. So each time you reduce carbohydrates, so you get a, a further reduction in HbA1c such that the, I think it's about, depending on how you analyze HbA1c, looking at about a 6 to 10 point decrease in HbA1c in milligrams per deciliter, going from 60% carbs down to 10% or so, which is pretty heavy restriction. But you know, it, the other interesting thing there, because yeah, I've spent the last 10 or 15 years arguing with people about this, I'm going, well, look, you're diabetic, you're having difficulty processing the carbohydrates you eat. They're not getting into cells well. They're sitting in your bloodstream for a long time, locating everything they touch. Not mm-hmm. only that, uh, you've got probably high insulin and that insulin in of itself is damaging. That's inflammatory and anabolic chronically, which is a problem. Inflammatory, uh, this inflammation is its primary cause of most chronic diseases. Uh, just don't eat the carbohydrate in the first place. Oh, well, I'm not sure about the evidence from randomized trials for that. And where's the long-term evidence and blah, blah, blah. Well, I think you know, this better analysis really puts that to bed once and for all about the efficacy of restricting carbohydrate. The more you restrict, the better you do as a type 2 diabetic, uh, and it's not just that, it's blood pressure, so similar linear reductions, weight showed similar linear reductions, the more you restrict, the more you lose. Uh, all the lipids go in the right direction, you have increases in HDL, the more you restrict, decreases of fasting triglycerides, you restrict. And the big baddies that apparently went up, well, total cholesterol and LDL, both really don't change too much, and if anything, so it's like trend on decrease. So yeah, I think really, I, I was pretty excited to see that paper. And for those of you who are out health coaching or working in with other providers and dietitians and doctors and the like, who are still a bit I don't know, reticent about that approach, this is a great paper. So it's a, it's a top shelf evidence. It's the study of the studies, the meta-analysis of the randomized trials, it's as good as it gets and the effects are striking. Oh, absolutely. They're so profound. And I think the point that you touched on about people being apprehensive about the application and the translation of the sort of these things into practice, when people accuse um, low carb of being ineffective when we translate it into practice, I, I would really rebel against that and get them to look at the VERTA trials who've just recently published their two-year follow-ups and people are maintaining or even continuing to uh, decrease HbA1c, which shows that reversal of diabetes is possible through lifestyle change. And I think that long-term trial accompanied with this really top-shelf evidence shows us that, you know, maybe we did get it wrong for a long time, but there is hope and we can get it right. And telling people that they can reverse their diabetes does give them hope and we should be doing more of it in practice. Yeah, the funniest thing, I 100% agree with all that. The funniest thing about all this at the moment is all the excitement around the SGLT2 inhibitors. Yep. And they, these are a drug that uh, work in the kidney to make sure you don't reabsorb glucose. So you actually end up urinating out a whole bunch of glucose from your bloodstream. It could be 60 to 100 grams a day, depending on, on who you are and what the dose of those inhibitors are. And yeah, you know, people are really excited about the these or they you know, they've been shown to reduce uh, heart disease, cardiovascular death, and those sort of hard endpoints as well as being good for diabetes. And that. So I'm calling these low carb mimicking drugs is what I'm calling them because you know, there's a couple of ways to get glucose out of your system. You can pee it out by taking drugs or you can just not eat it in the first place. And I'm not against these drugs and they've definitely got their place, but you know, why, why are we not better with the advice of just not eating glucose in the first place? 
Yeah, and I think it was only so long before the medical uh, pharmaceutical community cottoned on and, and produced a pill for what lifestyle can do, unfortunately. So let's kick into some of these questions. And the first question here I've got is, why is processed food like cheese and bacon recommended on a low-carb diet? Well, I'm not sure it is because I think I think what I I think we're profoundly going don't eat ultra processed food, so stuff that was never recently obviously alive. And yeah, the keto community is guilty as every other community in the food industry is in there, and you can get these fat bombs and you know I like a packaged super chocolate nut butter that I actually had some of at home better than anyone, but those aren't whole food. It's not shouldn't be the basis for your diet. Uh, so we're all for whole food. It's just like cheese and these things are processed foods. Uh, they're not ultra processed, but I think we talk about a level of processing that was sort of artisan or pre-industrial revolution as probably being acceptable. And yeah. so I think cheese and food, dairy and all these sorts of things, probably, provided you can tolerate those sort of stuff, struggle with. You know, to get to the question of bacon, you know, bacon really has a cult following. And, you know, for a while I had a t-shirt. You know, eat more bacon on it. Someone gave me a low carb conference, and yeah, you know, it was all good fun. <laughs> uh, and yeah, you know, I like bacon as much as you do. And I said, but yeah, you know, bacon is is processed meat. And, yeah. Uh, but I suppose the other thing way to think about processed meat is that not all bacon's created equal. The sort of thing you get from a, a corner butcher that's doing their own curing is is quite a different product than an antibiotic laden pig that was. Uh, had extra water injected into the bacon and it shrivels up when you cook it and it's full of uh, nit- nitrates and these sorts of things. It's is a very different product and I don't think anyone's recommended any of those. But yeah, the, the low-carb like, uh, keto community, which would both be part of Canada, is, as yeah. you know, yeah, not, not immune from the influences of, uh, of uh, ultra-processed food either. So can, can you be in nutritional ketosis and can these form part of your diet? Well, probably. Uh, and I think it's probably that three meal wall, isn't it? That 21 meals available, people take in a week and depending if you're fasting or not. And yeah, if you make 80 of them whole food, then more power to you. And if you fall off for the other three, well, yeah, you could possibly do better, but you, you live in a pathological food environment. So you're doing pretty well, frankly. Yeah, absolutely. I think the main takeaway there is that, um, no dietary trend, no group is ever immune from marketing at the end of the day. And uh, influencers are going to jump on bandwagons. Uh, that, like you say, there's a cult following with bacon. But if we are critical of what is whole, what is unprocessed, and we base our diet on that and then build from there, a little bit of bacon and some cheese is not the end of the world. If you're doing low carb or keto and you don't understand why you're not losing weight, but you're having bulletproof coffee for breakfast and bacon and cheese and cream cheese for lunch and then the same thing at dinner then maybe it's time to sort of reassess and start looking at reintroducing some of those low carbohydrate vegetables you know your uh, cruciferous vegetables your leafy greens getting those into your diet and pairing back the fat a little bit um the other thing with bacon is it's not great bang for buck in terms of protein so uh, it's very high it's higher in fat than it is in protein so choosing to have it every night for dinner is probably not the best idea uh, but it's not like it can't be part of a good diet. Then I've got to add in a few more things. Then of the, just a couple of things that people want. First of all, yeah, the amount of protein I think is important. You can just I, like I made a bit of a mistake with that with the original what the fat of the you know ten years ago. Now it's going you know be careful with your protein. You can over eat this. I think first of all, just you know go for it on the protein. Good quality protein. It's highly satiating, and I think you're just going to eat less the more protein you eat. And I think for most of us under eat protein, but it's expensive and hard to get. Uh, the second thing I just wanted to say in, in defense of the low carb is, is well, you know, there's all these other genres as well, that I mean, the vegans with the plant-based stuff and the impossible burgers, I mean, I pledge, it's all to process rubbish that you try to masquerade as a meat substitute. And Absolutely. So that, that, I mean, that's, that's And yeah, we will sort of go down that category. Uh, what was the one I was just listening to on the radio uh, this morning? about their oat milk. Yeah. I regard oat milk, frankly, as an ultra processed food, not a health food. You've somehow managed to extract milk from oats. Uh, <laughs> for God's sake. Uh, yeah, really. So anyway. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, the, the meat substitutes, the dairy substitutes, when you turn them over and 
look at the the list of ingredients that are in there and the amount of uh, soy and different binding agents and the level of trans fat and not good trans fat that we get from milk, the trans fats that come um, from industrial processing is just phenomenal. And even though they can masquerade as meat alternatives and promote themselves to be high in protein, the bioavailability of that protein and that iron is not well known. It's not well studied. So if you are a vegan, you're probably better to tend towards whole food sources than, um, quite frankly, junk food. Yeah, of course. So the next thing we're going to talk about is this idea of the glycemic index. And we had a student ask us, does glycemic index matter for weight loss and obesity prevention? And I guess on top of that question, Grant, is is glycemic index an outdated concept? Yeah, I think the, the idea of it's good to know what it is and how it came about and you can see the holes in it. I think I do think it's outdated now and tell you why in the moment. I do think what's important is what happens to the glucose and insulin in, in your blood. So that's a crucial concept and see why I'd say that as we get through this little topic. Uh, glycemic index was really developed for the University of Sydney. Jenny Brad Miller had healthy people, and that's an important thing. Healthy people eat insulin sensitive people eat a variety of foods and just measured their blood glucose response into those foods and then pegged them against uh, white rice, which had a, a glycemic index of 100. And so things were even more slowly absorbed and more rapidly absorbed than that. And so uh, it, it is all carbohydrate containing foods, of course, because they're the only things that are affecting that. That glycemia, and then people think had different glycemic indices. So, your brown bread with more fiber in it, possibly went slightly more slowly, and so raised the glucose less rapidly than, say, white bread. It's like the brown rice versus white rice. You know, these, these various sorts of things, and so on. So, that's all very interesting, but I think there's a couple of observations. First of all, it's a property of the food, not the person. So, why is that important? Well, it's important because people who are insulin sensitive or metabolically healthy or insulin resistant have a profoundly different effect. So even something has a reasonably good glycemic index for a healthy person will still give someone with insulin resistance hyperglycemia or hyperinsulin. In other words, it, it way over raises their blood glucose and their blood insulin. And the fact that it's going more slowly means that it's just high for longer. Uh, yeah, fair enough, it's better than the crappy, more easily absorbed carbohydrates, the white rice over the brown rice, the brown bread over the white bread sort of thing. Mm. But uh, it's still provoking the sort of metabolic response that we don't want. And so it's a property of the food, not the person. It's a problem I have with glycemic index. Uh, I think so far as that question is concerned about weight loss, I suppose the thing is for someone who's metabolically healthy, then improving the glycemic index of the food you eat will help. Then the next yeah. thing to think about as well, actually, who eats these foods by themselves? You know, yeah. I have a piece of plain white bread or plain white rice that's always eaten as a meat. Uh, and so we can start to think about the glycemic load, which I, I think about as two things. So it's the property of the, all of the food that goes into that person and it's how it affects their individual blood glucose response. So uh, you can imagine i just take me as an example because it can't really offend me. It's such a well <laughs> offender. Uh, but me as a 14 year old boy, I was probably much more insulin sensitive than I was when I was 35 and now as in my mid fifties, uh, I'm different again. So the exact same meal had a profoundly different effect on the glucose response and the insulin response that provoked, probably getting yeah. worse over those times. And so we imagine the glucose and insulin response I have is the glycemic low of that meal. Uh, it's really a property of the person and the meal they eat. And I think that's the important concept, is not the glycemic index. Glycemic low. And those will even vary within me. So I, I have a poor night's sleep and I'm stressed out. The exact same meal will have a different effect on me metabolically. In other words, it'll raise my glucose more and my insulin more when I'm stressed and underslept than when I'm calm and well slept. And so, yeah. so I think yeah, the glycemic index is past that's used by date, we shouldn't really use it anymore, it's, it's flawed, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't be interested in glycemia and insulin. We should be, we should be that glycemic loan, which is a property of the meal and the purse. Yeah, that's, that's my take, but what do you reckon about that? 
Oh, absolutely. Something I've been seeing a lot on social media floating around at the moment is this idea of, of dressing your carbs up. And I think as people who are interested in nutrition, it's nothing new to us. Um, just eating carbs by themselves are going to have your glucose firing up real quick and they're dropping down really fast. So let's say you, you wake up and you have a piece of jam toast for breakfast and then two hours later you're hungry. So you grab a bagel or a donut from the coffee can on the way to work and then two hours later you're hungry. So you have a panini with some ham and cheese in it. And to be honest, that's the first thing in the whole day that really is starting to look like something that resembles a meal. So I think when we're thinking about glycemic load, we're thinking about making sure that we're getting a good proportion of, um, if you are eating carbohydrates, which most of us are, even those who are low carb, that there's a good proportion of fat and protein paired with that carb. So dressing those carbs up. And that could be something as simple as if you want to have a banana for breakfast, um, have a tablespoon of peanut butter with it. Uh, if you want to have a smoothie, chuck some protein powder in there. So make sure that you are dressing those carbs up a little bit so that the glass, overall glycemic load um, is not so profound on the body. And um, if you have had a poor night's sleep, maybe look at paring your carbs down for the day because you know your body's not going to adjust so well to processing those carbs. Yeah. And there's also this is the time of day as well. So that's one thing we don't talk about is that you're actually more insulin sensitive in the morning typically than you are at night. And so this is the sort of old adage of eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. The saying, well, you know, if you're going to have bigger, the bigger meal, probably be off in the morning. And I think that's true. The trouble with that, of course, is hunger doesn't change that way. So the, the way the circadian clock works is, you know, eventually everyone's more hungry and eat. Yeah. So they're a bit like that. And, and, you know, with intermittent fasting, people are like, well, yeah, you know, you'd be much better fasting in the evening, which I agree would be, um, except for it would hurt a lot more um, and be socially not that much fun. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's another factor to take into place if you're thinking about the glycemic load of a meal is different in the morning than it is in the evening. Yeah. So we've got one last question and then we're going to wrap up. And this question is really about the interaction and, and risk between diabetes and the development of uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So we've got a student asking, can I ask if type 2 diabetes is the leading high risk factor of developing dementia? What does that mean with those with type 1 di diabetes? Are they less at risk, the same, or lower? What a great question. Oh, it's fantastic. What are the awesome students? So that's a good question. Does having high blood glucose a la type 2 diabetic, which is the way you diagnose type 2 diabetes? So pre-diabetes, fasting blood glucose, oh, what is the HbA1c? HbA1c over 40, so but under 50. Uh, so diagnosis of diabetes type 2 full, uh, HbA1c over 50. In, in the units we use in this country, at least. So, yeah, double your chance of Alzheimer's, particularly for women, uh, more so than men. High blood glucose is really the leading risk factor for, for poor neurological health into old age and, and reduce, you can reduce your risk. So that's a really important issue. Uh, Alzheimer's and dementia are vascular and metabolic diseases. Uh, we can sort those vascular risk factors. We can help uh, slow the progression. But does it mean it's going to be eliminated? I completely no. There's other risk factors as well. Some of those are genetic and other things we don't yet understand, like uh, how much you sleep, sleep quality, drugs, alcohol, all these sorts of things. But but glucose certainly plays a, a key role. And so then, well, the next question as well, if you've got type 1 diabetes, are you equally at risk as well? Well, I suppose it depends on how well you control your blood glucose. Because remember, yeah. type 1 diabetes isn't defined by having out of control blood glucose. It's defined by the inability to produce insulin from the pancreas that those cells of beta cells that produce insulin have uh, died off for some reason, most probably attacked by the body's own immune system or an immune situation of some sort. And so you'd have to try and now manage your blood glucose by injecting or having an insulin pump inject insulin into you to try and prevent your blood glucose from going too high. And the problem with that is that the body is much more finely tuned for that than the feedback that you get from testing your own blood glucose and injecting your own insulin in with a slightly automated process. And so you miss. 
and it's inevitable you're going to miss. So sometimes you take a little bit more insulin than you should, and your blood glucose goes down lower than it should. That's hypoglycemia, and it can be dangerous. It can be life threatening. Uh, and sometimes you miss by not injecting enough insulin and you run high blood sugar, but at least you don't get uh, low blood sugar. And that high blood sugar will increase your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia as much everything else, kidney disease, eye disease, uh, heart attack, stroke, because high blood glucose is the risk for all of those. And so, so type 1 diabetics can often have high blood glucose uh, outcomes, which is bad. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. So I've become a real fan of, of R.D. Dykeman, a, a doctor in the U.S. has, has proposed a, a lower carbohydrate method for managing type 1 diabetes. Uh, I'm not saying you should do this yourself. If you're type 1 diabetic, it's, it's meant to be help, but there's some really good evidence that you can get really good control. Uh, and if you're well fat adapted with a low carbohydrate diet as a type 1 diabetic, then you can reduce your risk of hypoglycemia, you know, really 18 fold, which is, you know, a fantastic outcome from you know, a hypo or two every day or a few times a week down to once a month or even less. And so I find that really, not really no expert in type 1 diabetes, but I find that quite convincing and a really interesting way to go. So that's probably the long answer to the short question. <laughs> Get your glucose down. Because <laughs> that one's our climbers, right? If you ask anyone about how they want to live the last decade or two of their life, no one is going to say, oh, I'd like to have better analytic towel accumulating in my brain. Uh, it's sort of spider webbing and uh, atrophying away, really, to be left with a, a body, but without my mind. I can't imagine anyone aspiring to, to that. Oh, absolutely not. And I definitely don't aspire to that. And I've still got a way to go before I'll be there. And I think it's, it's really interesting. We talk about blood glucose control and making sure that you're, you're staying in that sort of sweet spot. And it brings back to memory the paper we spoke about last week that talked about different sites of insulin resistance and the brain being one of those sites. And I think that that's a really interesting concept and therefore making sure that we're regulating our blood glucose, whether that's through a diet, exercise, a combination of the two is really important regardless of whether you have type 1, type 2 diabetes or you're just a seemingly normal, healthy individual, making sure that you stay in that sweet spot for a long time is going to have profound benefits on your physical health and your brain health. Couldn't agree more. And just to add to that last bit around the brain and insulin, insulin resistance, the, the brain actually can produce some of its own insulin as well. Exactly what that does and how that works, I think it's still to be unknown, but there's actually also insulin producing cells uh, in healthy human brain. So watch this space. Awesome. That's all our questions for today, Grant. Okay. Well, it's a wrap on the AMA a podcast with Precure. You've made it this far. Congratulations and thanks very much for being part of it. And as always, if you want to get on the show and have your question answered or just be part of the discussion, info at Precure.com. It's your soon.